Hi, I'm Eleanor Silverstein, and I am Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais's cousin, and I had the wonderful opportunity of, in my early 20s, getting to live with him in Tel Aviv, and so many stories. When I first moved to Tel Aviv, my parents had been living there and were getting ready to pack up and come back to the States. So we were crossing over within a couple of days. And the reason I bring this story up is Moshe and my mother were cousins and my mother, Hannah Elter, was raised by Moshe's mother and father because during the war, families were uh, changed around and people moved to different places within Russia and Poland to get to other family members so that they could move out. My mother was about five years old. So Moshe always knew my mother. He loved her and adored her because she had what they would say is a little piscala, meaning she had a mouth. She stood up for her rights and she stood up for everyone's rights. You don't get between that little girl and anyone if she felt something was happening wrong. That was the home in which she was raised by his parents. My mother, by the time she came to Israel, before it was Israel, she always said the United States did this beautiful thing where they just sent a whole lot of antibiotics to uh, help the new people in the country in case there was an infection. So my mother had come at, from the bottom of a ship. She arrived in, in it, what was not Israel yet. And she was sick with chicken pox and the meadle, measles and covered in lice from living in the bottom of a ship. And so they gave her an antibiotic and it ended up, no one knew, was ototoxic. It was toxic to the nerves within the ears. And within a week, my mother went from perfect hearing to being deaf. But nobody knew because my mother could read lips really well. And so they thought she was a snob, you know, when she had her back to you and you would talk and she wouldn't respond. But if you tap, she just turn around. So she learned at a young age. She learned multiple languages. Everything was fine. Moshe um, and and my mother and Moshe's brother, his sister, and Moshe, the whole family was very close and connected because even then when Moshe's parents grew, uh, flew, traveled to Israel, she still spent most of her time being raised by Moshe's mother and family more than her own mother who finally made it there. So moving forward, the two had quite a love for each other because she was the little Piscala girl in the family. She was the youngest of all. And so now my parents are getting ready to go back from Israel to the United States. And Moshe says, because he loved her so much, let me give you a lesson. Let me work with you. And my father comes and he's listening. And he, my mother lays down on the table and Moshe starts to gently roll her head lift a little shoulder and spends an inordinate amount of time touching along her neck, just very gently palpating the tone of her neck. And I'm thinking in my mind, I wonder why it's not, she doesn't have a head carriage like this. My mother has done yoga all of her life and Feldenkrais movement, she's got beautiful movement. So what's that all about? And then he would go back along the base of the skull and he would touch ever so gently. And that's all he was doing. And a couple of times just worked on her chest and her collarbones for breathing. And then back a little bit to the movement of the shoulders. And I thought, is he bored? Is he bored? Does he not know what else to do? Has he not touched his cousin in nearly a lifetime that he doesn't have a plan? And that was the whole lesson, 45 minutes. And, and he had a roll to her side, 
and he finishes by the end, rolling her head a little softly side to side. He has her roll to the side, come to sitting, brings her the typical lesson where he takes her by the, by the base of the skull and the jaw line and he brings her up and then sitting down, brings her up and sitting down and then moves her head a little bit. And it's a very typical lesson that we might see in Feldenkrais lessons. He tells her some things in Hebrew and he uses their top secret Hebrew that I couldn't understand because I speak Hebrew, I understand Hebrew, but they had their own cousin language that was a mix with Russian. So I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting. And so then there's a hug, kisses, and my parents leave and I stay in there. And I'm like, Moshe, what did you do? And he looks at me in the typical Feldenkraisian way and says, what do you think I did? I'm like, I'm not sure. I, did you have a plan? Were you bored? Are you tired? Are you not feeling well? He goes, no, no. I gave her the lesson of her life. And I'm like, what? He goes, think about it. So I go in and I check in. I'm like, well, da 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 the neck, rolling the head, all along the base of the skull. Now, in college, I graduated with a degree in biology and a degree in zoology. I loved anatomy, physiology, and neuroanatomy. And my favorite was neuroanatomy. And I loved the cranial nerves. And anyone that knows me now, 40 years later, knows I love the cranial nerves. And there's a group of nerves that come from the base of the brain and they go through the base of the skull. And I thought, huh, did you work with her vagal nerve? I don't think I called it vagus, right? That's the more modern version. My professors called it vagal. Could did you work with her vagal nerve? And he turns and looks at me and he says, how do you know what the vagal nerve is? And I'm like, what, you think I wouldn't know what the vagal nerve is? I can tell you all cranial nerves in order by heart and sing it in a song. And he's like, oh, why yes, I was working on her vagal nerve. And I'm like, okay, is it for anxiety? Is it post-trauma? from the war? Is it something? And he goes, I'll let you think about it. And he says, but I will tell you this, she's going to have her hearing back. And I go, how could she have her hearing back? She's deaf. The nerves were damaged. She has a computer in each ear. They were the highest quality known, huge hearing aids back then highest every time she got the highest quality they were so computerized it was unbelievable and yet she then had instead of 100 percent loss 85 percent loss so she could get 15 percent with those hearing aids so we go on to talk about the vagal nerve and its innervations and what happens when you can just softly touch in the palpating soft way, you see, I'm not grabbing the tissue this way that some people you see on using social media doing. It's this, he's checking the tone. That's all he was doing was checking the tone in the quality of not the musculature, but in the skin. And through the skin, through the muscles, to the, through the sternocleidomastoid, the muscle that connects the base here from your skull to your sternum and to your clavicle, hence sternocleidomastoid bone, and the turning of the head is that, right? Because we can call that the ballerina muscle you know, when a ballerina is back here, but if a person's chronically stressed, 
the nerve, the vagus nerve, the vagal nerve is innervated within that. So by the way, is the carotid artery. And this took me years to think about what he was saying, except in that moment that I knew that that soft, gentle palpation was going to be the thing. My father called me when they got back to the United States and he said, Eleanor, your mother can hear 100% since the lesson. Now, mind you, they flew coach. So if it was a chiropractic session, those vertebrae would have been out by the time they schlepped luggage and, and traveled in seats that pushed like this. So it had nothing to do with that. It was a recalibration and balancing within the nervous system through light and gentle touch and soft, easy movement. She had 100% of her hearing back for one solid year from that one 40 minute lesson. And I would talk to Moshe more about the cranial nerves because he, there was a neurologist that he used to have that was a very dear friend of him, a, a very dear friend of his, that he had actually come to our class uh, in the fourth year of our training was in Tel Aviv while Moshe was still alive. Some people stayed in Amherst and those of us were in Tel Aviv. And um, he, the neurologist came and he talked to us. He taught us so much about neurology in a way that is never, ever taught. And it was in his experiences of understanding human nature. And by looking at our structures and functions and in terms of trauma before trauma work was ever done. And then in terms of the Feldenkrais method. So it can help you to understand why in the other story that I tell, which is why you couldn't take this work and turn it into just a talk method work because this work is so deeply experiential and light touch has to be taught. It has to be experienced. It doesn't mean that's the only way the Feldenkrais method is. And it's certainly not the only way he taught. When Moshe was friends with Ida Rolf, he checked out going deep. And sometimes he did. He went very, very deep. And he was in an era of going very, very deep, which I found so interesting because in his last year of his life, which is when he was giving my mother the lesson, he was working really deep. He was almost remodeling musculature in people and the children and working with them on hard rollers rather than the soft foam rollers and doing big, gigantic movement. That is why I was so surprised that when my mother came in, I thought, wow, is he afraid to touch her? Because it was so meek and mild. It wasn't meek. It was exactly what she needed. That's the Feldenkrais method, is working with a person right here, right now in exactly the way they need it. Whether it's biologically, physically, developmentally crawling and creeping and crawling and rolling, athletically, neurologically, in my mother's cases, neuro and anatomically, I had never ever seen him work neuroanatomically to get one nerve. So for those people who think the vagus nerve is this new thing that people are talking about, it's not. Those of us who studied the nerves coming from the brain know very well what these cranial nerves do. We know even better now. We knew pretty well what those cranial nerves do. And Moshe knew really well. 
which was interesting because I never heard him talk about it to anybody else, let alone the training programs. Which is why he said to people, take this work, practice it, do it again and again and again with nothing else mixed with it until you have truly learned the 10,000 hours of mastering it before you explore other possibilities that you might add with it. And here's the thing. He never even got to the part of being able to show you this light touch, this touch about neuroanatomy. And everybody got stuck in the, it's just these other ways. But if you did what he asked you to do, which is to make your handprint in this world, in this work, then you explore and you expand and you grow the work in all the ways that Moshe Feldenkrais dreamed you would. So moving forward, my mother lived to the ripe age, beautiful age of 93. And my brother, who was an engineer, because all the men in the family were engineers, couldn't understand from day to day how she could go from not hearing to days that she could hear perfectly. Perfectly when she was facing the other way. And he would say something under his breath facing the other way. And my mother would turn to him and respond. And he would text me, how did she hear? How did she hear? I go, because she had a really good day. Her vagus system is on. So think about that in your own life, that how you live your life, how you touch others, how you could touch yourself. It was his dream that it is in more depth tomorrow than it was yesterday. That's the depth and breadth of this work. And I'm thankful to this day, but it took me about 30 years, by the way, to figure out in detail before I actually started teaching about the Vegas system. And I'm thankful, I'm a slow thinker. <laughs> I hope you take it faster than I did. Have a great day.